A beautiful garden, a dream for some of us, a reality for others. In fact, gardening is one of the most popular pastimes in America. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. Gardens, of course, take many forms, from the classic landscaping of the great European houses to simple vegetable gardens or this pleasant backyard in Northern California. In our gardens, we try to bring order to nature, to bend her to our will. And if you're one of America's millions of gardeners, you know that it's hard work. Turn your back for a minute and the weeds take over. But for all the work we put into our gardens, we are largely unaware of the many fascinating natural events taking place in them. The compost heap where we throw autumn leaves and our other garden refuse. A stone wall if we're lucky enough to have one. The encroaching weeds and other wild plants all hold secrets. And using some very special filming techniques, our program reveals some of the hidden natural wonders of a garden. Whether built along the edge of a blue country pond or in the heart of a great modern city, the construction of gardens is as ancient as civilization itself. The type of garden, the forms that emerge, the shapes, colors, and size are bounded only by nature's constraints. They have always been a source of inspiration, meditation, and relaxation. Some, as in England, are hundreds of years old, handed down through generations of families and their gardeners. Most of us may never achieve in our own backyard gardens the magnificence of the stately homes of England. But wherever or whoever the gardener, the problems of maintaining law and order are exactly the same. The gardeners are barely in control as they pull weeds and assault the villains of the rose border with chemical weapons. It's all out war as we fight to hold the rightful occupants of our private patch at bay. Yet the margin between our success and failure is narrow. However hard we work, the invasion force is waiting to take over. Some, like this ladybug feeding on aphids, carry on regardless of our presence. Perhaps they would do even better than us in their pest control if we left them to their own devices. How does a garden grow once the hand of its human master is removed? In England, which has such a great tradition in gardens, we see how nature, unassisted and unchained, recreates a miniature wilderness of its own design. Ladybugs are joined by other insects, hurrying from the cover where they sought refuge from the physical and chemical war waged against them. The stage is now set for them to pursue their destinies according to the laws of nature. A sepsid fly basks in the sun, unaware of approaching danger. This is the world of predator and prey, the hunter and the hunted. The wolf spider captures its prey and injects a deadly poison. Then it pumps in an enzyme to predigest the fly. It even has two of its eight eyes on the back of its head and can see all around while it sucks its victim dry. Following their parents to the feast on the aphids, ladybug larvae come to gorge themselves before adopting the black-spotted forewings of adulthood.
but the aphids do not surrender their lives that easily. Individually, they can keep off both ladybug and larva with an oily glue that can be seen here oozing from flexible tubes on the aphid's back. And they have an early warning system, a chemical scent whose release warns a sister aphid it has three minutes to get away. On the face of things, it might seem that this once highly organized residence is slowly being engulfed by a world of natural chaos. Certainly, humanity has lost control. But what is really happening as this garden is swallowed by wilderness? Beneath the encroaching jungle of plants, no longer cleared away by the gardener, the natural processes of decay are at work. As plants die back, an army of fungi swarms over them, breaking down their tough cellulose and recycling life-supporting nutrients. Fungal spores, minute but a hundred times larger than bacteria, sprout hyphae, invisible threads that invade the plant cells and form ever-expanding mats. As they spread, they are continuing the breakdown, transforming the plant tissues into sugars that support future growth. The hyphae lie hidden until they put forth their fruiting bodies in a spectacular display. Each tiny capsule contains more than a thousand spores, and upon ripening, they'll release them to colonize more dead plants. Fueled by these miniature agents of decay, an army of vegetation marches defiantly across the flower beds of the garden. But the face of the surrounding garden wall is not so easily overcome by plants. On a bare patch, a female chaffinch plucks at a useful but reluctant tangle of nest material. And for a great tit, there is still a clear way in to a safe nesting hole. Nearby, a hairy-footed flower bee digs a small single hole into the mortar between the stones. In the short tunnel, it excavates side chambers, and into each of these it deposits a single egg with a large store of pollen and nectar for its developing grubs. But the hidden nectar attracts ants. The bee is evicted, turned back by the toxic formic acid that the ants release. Despite its formidable size and powerful jaws, it's defeated by the ants. After a few forlorn attempts to regain control of its hard-earned nectar, the bee gives up. But space on the wall for such real-life dramas is becoming less available. With each day of growth, invading plants are making their presence felt crowding out the remaining occupants. At the base of the wall, a colony of common lizards emerges to soak up the early morning heat. 
In order to reach the peak of their activity, they come out of their hiding places and flatten their bodies to the sun until they reach a critical 86 degrees. With their flicking tongues, they literally taste the air, and then they're ready for action. A wolf spider out hunting is spotted, and now the hunter becomes the hunted. In the cracks of the wall above the lizards, the mosses are spreading slowly. Female cells in the tips of these tufts are fertilized by male cells carried by insects. And as this cushion is laid down, so the seeds of larger plants, like the groundsel, carried through the air on their parachutes of fine white hairs, can take root and grow. Some plants, like sticking billy, scale the cliff face. Others, like the toad flax, have an even more ingenious way of colonizing the wall. The stem arches over, away from the light, toward the shaded cracks. The seeds are deposited and later germinate in the dark. In this way, along with its long-rooted runners, the toad flax spreads across the face of the wall. But its success can be short-lived. For there's one plant, ivy, the champion of wall climbers, which pays no respect to the ingenuity of others, and soon dominates them all. It produces hundreds of clinging, smothering rootlets. These grow out from the main stem, enabling the plant to penetrate every tiny fissure in the wall. Ivy is so successful that other plants on the wall are smothered out of existence. The outcome of this takeover is good for the male blackbird. He stands guard above the female on their hidden nest. A local cat has been quick to spot the advantages of what happens when humans retreat from the garden. Neglected logs on the once closely shaved lawn now provide safe homes for small mammals like the bank vole. To stay put in the presence of danger is to stay alive. Frogs seek refuge in the forgotten swimming pool. Its unchlorinated depth now providing an ideal home. It's March, and the males advertise their intentions by voice. After attracting a mate, you'll have to keep rival males at bay with even more croaking. The blackberry canes are adorned with frog spawn. In the front garden, a bee fly takes advantage of the spring bloom. Bee flies look as though they might sting, but they don't. They mimic the bumblebee, and this one is investigating the obricia. Even at the back, the spring bulbs are still able to make a show in the midst of neglect. They bloom before the trees come into leaf or a new blanket of undergrowth blocks the light from them. So the gardener's absence is no problem to the eggs of the lackey moth. They've survived the winter unsprayed, and so unharmed, the caterpillars now emerge from their eggs.
To the average gardener, this backyard is riddled with pests and decay and lush with forests of weeds. But to the children, it's an overgrown playground where they're safe from adults and can be themselves. Meanwhile, as they continue to explore the forgotten garden, the missile thrush is incubating her eggs. Young robins just out of the nest, begging for more food from their overworked parents. On the abandoned compost heap, starlings take advantage of the emerging leather jackets and wire worms, food to satisfy the hunger of their growing brood in one of the garden's abandoned sheds. This snake-like creature is not a serpent, but a slow worm. Snakes cannot blink, so this sleepy eye must belong to a legless lizard. A small colony of slow worms was here even in the heyday of the garden. It's now flourishing in the gardener's absence. Silent, secretive, and about 12 inches long, it prefers not to be disturbed. Despite the innate fear of snakes that it rouses in each of us, the slow worm, which eats slugs, can be the gardener's greatest friend. This one is not trying to eat a rival, but is a female delivering a bite, and that's unusual. In courtship, the male should be nipping her. The male is trying to gain control of the situation, although she's a little too fat for him to get a grip. He's still finding her a bit difficult to grasp, and she's still got him by the scales. But her sensuous movements look like they have more to do with courtship than aggression. After mating, she will keep the eggs inside her body and give birth to eight or nine young, each with a life expectancy of up to 50 years. The lackey moths are now in full swing with their attack on the rose bushes. The marauding gang still sticks close together for protection and they've also spun a silken tent to hide in. But when alone, each may rely on its coat of many colors to warn off those animals which might wish to eat it. It could be said that the caterpillars are keeping the overgrown roses under control Many creatures that we call pests are nature's way of keeping a balance. The lackeys eat till they burst, or at least split their gaudy jackets. Taking a necessary break from feeding, each caterpillar returns home to the tent to molt in the safety of the crowd. What emerges is a little less colorful, but the pallid face will turn blue again within hours. Theatrical masks festoon the tent, 
But these discarded skins have a function too, as dead totems they still warn off would-be predators. Down in the swimming pool, the frog spawn has hatched, and hungry tadpoles scrape a meal from the green algal scum. The successful spawning in March produced more tadpoles than the limited food in the pond can support. Therefore, some tadpoles will indulge in cannibalism. But as throughout the garden, there are also natural predators here to help restore the balance between vegetation and those who were born to feed on it. This two tadpole a day larva will soon turn into a two tadpole a day great diving beetle. On the makeshift lake surface above, Another cleaning up operation is playing its hand. Pond water striders have found a dead wasp and systematically set about sucking the juices from its body. If this wasp lost its life in a search for food, others of its kind are having more success. For the bumblebee, being dismembered alive is a desperate end. But the economics of biology demand that there should be little waste. Predators and scavengers patrol the garden, alert to every opportunity. Dismantled, the bee is just a little more protein to be taken back to the communal stomach of the colony. Home to blue tits and more glorious garden days, this nest box's entrance attracted a queen wasp and now houses her growing brood. The cells within are cramped by the swelling bodies of wasps in the making. They're fed on the remains of captured insects brought in from the garden. So this is really pest control headquarters, an industrious society that benefits the garden as a whole. Worker wasps feed each other from time to time in between regurgitating insects to the larvae. Mutual feeding helps the workers to recognize each other. It's a chemical communication system. The wasp on the left taps with its antennae on the mandibles of the wasp on the right, who donates some saliva. Workers also take syrup from the larvae, which puts extra carbohydrates into their own diet. Some larvae have now pupated in the cells that are being incubated. Heat from this muscular movement keeps the sealed pupae warm. Temperature in the nest is precisely regulated. Air is moved around the galleries of the nest by wasps fanning their wings. As the number of cells and pupae increase, so the chambers must be expanded. The paper they build with is made from chewed wood. The salivary pulp is held in a ball under the chin, and the jaws are used to trowel it into place. Once the new ribbon of pulp is in position, the wasp goes back over it until it is flat and uniform and well secured to the previous bit of paper. And so the envelope covering the cells is formed, a light yet sturdy structure that may be the size of a football.
Almost any hole or crevice can become a home. This late nesting nuthatch needs an exactly nuthatch sized hole, one too tight to fit sparrows or starlings. This opening's a little large, but being good plasterers, they will soon build it down to a size that will safely accommodate their expected brood. But long before the young nuthatches have even hatched, the baby missile thrushes will have left the safety of their open plan nest site. So much fresh meat growing in the garden is good news for the little owl, which has taken up residence. But this rabbit is too large for consideration. Rabbits, though, could overrun the garden in a single year, for each female can produce up to 30 young in a season. And the strictly day-hunting little owl won't be able to make a meal of the occupants of another tree hole either, for they are travelers of the dead of night. Bats. There are just females and their young in this summer roost of pipistrelle bats. About three inches long, it's England's smallest bat, a flying, insect-eating mammal which hibernates during the winter. As flying mammals, they do have certain problems. When the female has given birth to her single baby, she can no longer hunt for five hours each night. She must make only brief feeding excursions, returning frequently to nurse the baby. The mothers return to suckle the youngsters. A newborn clings to its mother tightly, and she even carries it around for a few hours. The older ones wait for their meals. The baby, only about two hours old, is suckling its mother's milk. It will be three weeks, though, before it's able to leave the tree hole on its own and fly off into the night. Nighttime brings out a new population of animals, ones that were always here, even when logs crackled in the house and the garden lawn was as smooth and green as a pool table. For them, the departure has made little difference, except perhaps that there are now more dangers awaiting them in the dark. Wood lice press their bodies against damp stones to absorb moisture. And a long-tailed field mouse prepares to venture forth into the jungle. The full moon is unveiled, throwing light on the shadowy dramas about to unfold. Nails feast on succulent leaves, tearing away at the greenery with tough, rasping mouthpieces. They don't have far to travel in their search for food, surrounded as they are by such abundance. But the hedgehog is also on the prowl and looking for one kind of food in particular, snails.
Nearby, the scent of a long-tailed field mouse has aroused the hungry interest of a weasel. For the mouse, there can be little hope of escape. The weasel kills with one bite to the back of the mouse's neck. This long-legged creature coming to feed on a dead mouse is a daddy long legs, a relative of the spider, but without poison in its fangs. Its body is a quarter of an inch long and is almost completely round, lacking the distinctive waistline between abdomen and thorax, typical of spiders. Touching and smelling with those sensory palps is more efficient than using the two eyes that are perched on top of the body. The second of the four pairs of long limbs are also highly sensitive, perfectly designed to detect animal food, dead or alive. A daddy long legs with its legs caked in dirt is somewhat like a man blindfolded and dragging a ball and chain. So a great deal of time is devoted to personal hygiene. This male is drawing its leg about as long as your thumb gracefully through its pincers. A laborious task, perhaps, but the only way to keep active and alert. Midsummer dawns in the garden and there's a profusion of color and activity. Some insects work furiously to collect nectar, while others, like the peacock butterfly, first soak up the sun. And the ladybugs are keeping up their relentless battle against the aphids. But even pausing to clean up after each meal is to give the aphids time to increase their numbers. This young aphid will be giving birth itself in about 10 days' time. Female aphids are born pregnant, and the whole population will double every three days. The ladybugs will never go hungry. Black flies are aphids too, cousins in arms sucking the juices of the lush, overgrown thistles. This tiny parasitic wasp makes an investment in black flies. She aims to lay her eggs in aphids, but they are no easy target. Only by bending her abdomen under and extending it forward can she get past the aphids defending legs. Aphids are perhaps the most important food item in the garden's ecosystem. By midsummer, the tiny wasp's success can be measured in the empty husks of aphids eaten out by its larvae.
The new community of plants in the garden is, like the insects, subject to its own rules. Docks and thistles are beginning to overcome the lawn's resilient grasses, and in time, shrubs and young trees will follow. Nettles grasp the shadier corners, where immune to the stinging leaves on which they feed, the caterpillars of the small tortoiseshell butterfly live in peace. One of the more common English butterflies, two or more batches of eggs may be laid each year. Once thistles gain a foothold, they quickly outcompete most other plants. Their bulging seed heads indicate the garden is being taken over by the roughest of weeds. High summer, the children return to the garden. Now they are dwarfed by the grasses that compete among themselves to dominate the landscape. While the children sit in their secret corner, they are oblivious to a worker ant carrying out the unromantic process of recycling waste, a process that supports the whole garden. Nothing is wasted. Red ants not only dispose of all manner of bodies, but also feed on nectar and carry the seeds of plants back to their nests. The hoverfly is dragged below ground to the heart of the fortress, and that's where its body will be reprocessed, converted ultimately into food for the growing young. In this colony, there may be dozens of closely related queens, all producing eggs for the workers to raise. But when disturbed, all hands and jaws are sent directly to carry the helpless grubs and eggs to a safer corner of the nest. As they toil, it matters little to the tireless insects that exotic perennial food plants now freed from the shackles of cultivation, are joining the great plant race for success in the garden. Horseradish and rhubarb from China are gaining ground, and spears of asparagus stand firm, their position betrayed only by the attentions of an asparagus beetle. Meanwhile, beneath the overgrown compost heap, something stirs. A secret visitor laid these eggs six weeks ago, and now the mass of leathery shelled eggs is about to hatch. Grass snakes taste their new world before they see it.
Once they see it, they never close their eyes on it. For unlike the slow worm, snakes do not have eyelids. Laid at the same time, the pencil length grass snakes will all hatch together over a 24 hour period. Like many snakes, grass snakes are not poisonous and can do no harm to people. Finally, they break free, leaving their original life support system, their shell membranes, behind. Easily recognized by their collar, the two patches of yellow behind the head, these harmless snakes may grow as long as your arm. With a good eye for prey, they seek out worms and fly larvae, and will even tackle a baby frog. But by preying on pests, grass snakes help maintain the natural balance in the garden. For the plants, the rain is welcome. It refuels growing tissues. Plant leaves are specially designed so that excess water runs off them and down toward their roots. But animals do not take so kindly to the sudden downpour. While caterpillars are beaten to the ground, a field mouse scampers back to the safety of the wall. The wall provides a safe tunnel for the nest of the field mouse, and her family is snug and warm out of the rain. These young field mice are now a few days old. Born pink, blind, and helpless, within 10 days they will be old enough to leave the safety of the nest, although they will continue to suckle until they're three weeks old. Each female mouse can give birth to five litters of six babies every breeding season. And as the young themselves start reproducing before winter, a single adult pair can be responsible for hundreds of new mice every year. Though very few of all these young will actually survive the winter, the long-tailed field mouse is one of the most abundant garden rodents. When the rain is finally over, the animals emerge once more. And while some come to drink or just wallow in the wet, Others come out to feed. The slow worm's movements are even slower than usual. It's not surprising, for the first cool days of autumn are approaching. It's time for the caterpillars, which will not grace the garden with their adult beauty until next spring, to undergo dramatic change. The nettles that were both food and cover in the summer are now a changing room for the caterpillar to reshuffle its body inside a chrysalis. In less than a minute, the skin is split and shrugged off, and the pupa must attach to the silken pad on the stem. 
the old skin is twitched away, and in three weeks, the small tortoiseshell butterfly will emerge and seek a protected place in which to hibernate. The fruits of autumn hide a tawny owl. The season will slowly peel the covers from this daytime roost. For now, the owl lies in wait for those that come to eat the fruits. Bank voles come to the harvest supper whose fallen fruits nourish the second generation of voles this year. By the time the unpicked apples fall, the number of voles is huge, but despite the abundance of food, each vole can only expect to live months, not years. Most fall prey to little owls, tawny owls, kestrels, weasels, and foxes, the predatory birds and mammals of the garden. But it's not surprising that the voles should throw caution to the wind when the blackberry and apple harvests are left to rot on the ground rather than ending up as jam. The wasp's sleepy search for sweetness brings it to the neglected crop on the apple tree. The workers are now freed from their slavery of feeding grubs and fend only for themselves. The colony is breaking down. This worker is losing a battle with a larger, fertile male, a drone. Win or lose, neither will survive the winter ahead. The privilege of survival rests only with the queen and activity in the nest is geared to this end alone. The ventilation system is still working. The larger chambers are the ones containing the fertile wasps. The crowning achievement of the year's labors. Few people like wasps. They threaten us with that black and yellow warning of their potent stings, and their blind, instinctive sense of purpose may seem quite sinister. Yet, they do us good. Free of charge, they kill what we regard as garden pests. They're as much a part of the natural scheme as any other creature, and their presence in the abandoned nest box is a crucial element in the natural success of the overgrown garden. These males will mate with the new queens, then they, like the workers and the old queens, will die. A bundle of drones tumbles from the nest, competing for a queen. Once mated, she will overwinter alone and start a new colony single-handedly in the spring. But the emptying of the nest does not signal the end of the garden's autumnal activities. There is still one burst of energy in store on the garden wall. Here, the ivy becomes a paradox in nature. It flowers in autumn 
and by so doing becomes a haven for every flying insect left in the garden. This is the only supply of nectar around, the ivy's clever way of ensuring its pollination. The garden has finally laid its summer treasures to rest. But the children who shared in its delights are reluctant to leave. The paradise that was enjoyed by the children has been sold and the new owners want it cleared out, the land reclaimed. But for the children, the magic and the memories of the year the forgotten garden was left to itself will be with them always. <laughs>